قد أفلح المؤمنون أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين وسيد النبيين وخير الخلائق أجمعين أبو القاسم محمد المصطفى وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم عبس وتولى أن جاءه الأعمى وما يدريك لعله يزكى أو يذكى فتنفعه الذكرى أما من استغنى فأنت له تصدى وما عليك ألا يزكى وأما من جاءك يسعى وهو يخشى فأنت عنه تلهى صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم والعن عداءهم أجمعين سورة عبسة is one of the frequent surahs that are discussed when it comes to Sunni Shia polemics especially regarding the life, infallibility and overall conduct of the Holy Prophet peace be upon him and his family this is because of the first two verses of this chapter which say he frowned and turned away because the blind man came to him who is this he? who frowned and turned away from the blind man? Sunnis and Shias interpret these verses differently and each group has a different answer. In this video, we'll answer the question, compare both points of views, and come to a decisive conclusion on who's right. We'll start with the Sunni narrative. Open up any Sunni tafsir book and you'll read what the scholars have said when explaining the context of these verses to us. We will read that the Prophet ﷺ is being reprimanded because he frowned at a weak man. More than one of the scholars of Tafsir mentioned that one day during his preaching mission in Mecca, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, was addressing one of the great leaders of the Quraysh, hoping that he would accept Islam. While he was having a conversation with him, Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, a blind person and someone who had accepted Islam in its earliest days, came to the Prophet. Ibn Umm Maktoum then began asking the Messenger of Allah about something, urgently beseeching him. The Prophet really wanted the Quraysh leader to convert to Islam and didn't want any interruptions, so he asked Ibn Umm Maktoum to wait for a moment so he could complete his conversation by frowning in the face of Ibn Umm Maktoum and turning away from him in order to face the other man. Thus, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed he frowned and turned away because there came to him the blind man and how can you know that he might become pure? What I've just said can be found in the Tafsir of Ibn Kathir the most popular Sunni tafsir book. The other famous Quranic interpreters agree with him and they too have recorded in their books that the person who frowned and turned away is the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, like Tabari, Qurtubi, Zamakhshari, Ar-Razi, Al-Baydawi, uh, Al-Suyuti, Al-Bahawi, and many, many more. Not to mention that they have authentic hadiths in their corpus that confirm this. So it's appropriate to say that the default Sunni position is that the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, frowned and turned away from the blind man. Even now, if you try and go to YouTube and see what the famous Sunni speakers say regarding this surah, you will see all of them confirming this, and they gladly declare it, showing supposedly how the Prophet was nothing but a simple man, and because of this, it's possible for Allah to reprimand him for something. And because of this, they will often come to us, the followers of the Ahlul Bayt, and ask us, Oh, how can you believe that the Prophet was 100% infallible and never did a single mistake in his life? What about this surah? Doesn't it clearly show the Prophet isn't perfect, as you Shias claim? And our answer is very simple, because we respond by saying that the individual mentioned in the surah who frowned and turned away from the blind man wasn't the Prophet. No. So who was it then, according to us? We read in Tafsir al-Safi, volume 7, page 399. He frowned and turned away when the blind man came to him. Al-Qummi said, It, meaning this verse, was revealed regarding Uthman and Ibn Umm Maktoum. Uthman here is Uthman bin Affan. 
Ibn Maktum used to call for the Messenger of Allah and he was blind. He came to the Messenger of Allah while he was in the company of some of his companions and Uthman was also present. The Messenger of Allah gave precedence to Ibn Umm Maktum over Uthman. So Uthman frowned and turned away from him. Then Allah revealed the verse, he frowned and turned away, meaning Uthman, when the blind man came to him. And in Al-Majma' it is narrated from As-Sadiq that this verse was revealed concerning a man from the Banu Umayyah, which is just an indirect reference to Uthman, who was in the presence of the Prophet Then Ibn Umm Maktum came, and when he, meaning Uthman, saw him, he frowned and drew himself away from him, turning his face away. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala narrated this incident and disapproved of it. In the Sunni narrative, the blind man came to the Prophet while he was conversing with the Quraysh leaders. Because he didn't want to get interrupted, the Prophet frowned and turned away from him, so Allah revealed these verses strictly reprimanding him. In the Shia narrative, as we've just read, the blind man also came seeking the Prophet, and he came next to Uthman. When Uthman saw Ibn Umm Maktoum coming to ask some questions, he frowned and turned away his face from him, out of arrogance and was annoyed by his mere presence. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed these verses strictly reprimanding Uthman. So no, we don't believe the Prophet did something wrong, nor do we believe he could even consider doing such a thing. Hasha lillah, hasha malyon marra. But you know, uh, what's really the saddest thing? From personal experience, I have seen many times where, when discussing with Muslims of other denominations, when we tell them we believe Abbas wa Tawalla is about Uthman and not the Prophet, they will just lose their mind. No, how can you say this is about Sayyiduna Uthman? How dare you insult him? To which I reply, Subhanallah, when we say a companion did it, suddenly it's almost blasphemy and hardcore Rafidism. But when we say the Prophet did it, then that's okay? You don't find anything wrong with that? Do you really hold more respect for a fallible companion than the best of all creation? Is this not an insult to Rasulullah? And this just shows you the difference between the school of the Ahlul Bayt and the other schools. The other schools say this is about the Prophet. For example, Qurtubi narrates in his Tafsir book, volume 22, page 71. After this incident, the Prophet always gave Ibn Umm Maktoum a warm welcome. Whenever he met him, he said, Welcome to the man for whose sake my Lord reprimanded me. Now compare this to what the Ahlul Bayt have said. We read in Majma al Bayan, volume 10, page 205 to 206. It is narrated from As Sadiq that he said, The Messenger of Allah وآله, used to say when he saw Abdullah bin Umm Maktoum, Welcome, welcome. By Allah, Allah never reprimanded me because of you. Subhanallah, see the dichotomy here? So tell me, who respects the Prophet more? The answer is very obvious. Now, there will be some people who still want to argue that no, Abbas wa Tawalla is about the Prophet because that's just what the Quran says. The Arabic is clear and claiming it's someone else goes against the clear context of the Quran. To which I reply, firstly, no it doesn't. <laughs> Let's read the surah again. Abbas wa Tawalla an a'ma. He frowned and turned away because there came to him the blind man. The third person is being used here. He frowned and he turned away because there came to him the blind man. Who is the he here? Does it say the prophet? Does it say the messenger? Does it say Muhammad? It says Abasa. That's it. It doesn't say Abasa Nabi or Abasa Muhammad. He frowned. That's it. The only way to know who it is is by checking the tafsir or interpretation, obviously. And we'll see later how even without tafsir and using just the Qur'an alone, we can know it's definitely not the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. So the Arabic in no way says it's him. And despite that, you will still find many misleading and biased English translations. Many of them can be found in Qur'an.com, as we can see here. For example, Sahih International says he, and then in brackets, it says, i.e. the Prophet, frowned and turned away. Tia Usmani says he, in parentheses the Prophet, frowned and turned his face. A Yusuf Ali, in parentheses the Prophet, frowned and turned away. And Al Hilali and Khan, the Prophet, in parentheses, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, frowned and turned away. See how they include the Prophet in parentheses? 
I've even seen some translations where they just straight up write the prophet without any parentheses or brackets. And this doesn't happen only in English. All the other languages have the same problem. And this is problematic for non-Arabic speakers because they are led to believe the prophet did it, despite the Arabic not saying it. But whatever the case may be, some people will suggest it doesn't make sense for it not to be addressed to the prophet because the first two verses use the third person and then in the next verses it switches to the second person. So clearly Allah is talking to the prophet. To which I reply that not only this is an absurd and baseless claim in the Arabic language, but maybe if you've read the Quran, you would have known the same structure is used elsewhere. Indeed, we read in Surah Al-Qiyamah, chapter 75, verses 31 to 34. And he had not believed, nor had he prayed, but instead he denied and turned away, and then he went to his people, swaggering in pride, Woe to you and woe. See how at the beginning it uses the third person, but then it switches to the second without changing the person being addressed? And this definitely isn't the Prophet. In the same way, Surah Abasa isn't about him either. For the Arabic and context to have been more consistent and perhaps hold more weight, all of it should have been in the second person. So instead of saying, Abasa wa tawalla an ja'ahu al-a'ma, it should have been عَبَسْتَ وَتَوَلَّيْتَ أَنْ جَاءَكَ الْأَعْمَى Maybe if it was worded like this, some sort of argument could be used, but we don't work with hypotheticals. And I'm being extremely generous here because it still couldn't be the Prophet. Besides, in the Qur'an, when the Prophet is the only one included in a conversation between him and Allah, the second person is always used. But when it's a matter where multiple people are in included in the conversation, like when Allah is talking with the Mu'mineen or the Sahaba or anyone else, then we can find examples where the third person is being used. But other than that, when there's no one else included and it's just between the Prophet and Allah, it will always be in the second person. In the verse of Abasa wa Tawalla, that is only between Allah and the Prophet. There is no one else included inside that conversation, so that's why it's illogical to say, Oh, it just happens that this is the only time in the Qur'an where the third person references uh, the Prophet Now, some of them will still come up with many excuses to keep on arguing it was indeed the Prophet and even say there's nothing wrong in believing it was him. They say that this is a clear example of what we call a criterion of embarrassment. A criterion of embarrassment is a type of historical analysis in which a historical account is deemed likely to be true under the inference that the author would have no reason to invent a historical account which might embarrass them. So in this case, Sunnis will say that if the Prophet made up the Qur'an and didn't receive revelation, then it wouldn't make sense for him to embarrass himself or portray himself in a negative manner in Surah Abasa which means this makes it more likely that he indeed was a prophet and that the Qur'an is the word of God. I say that this claim in itself is embarrassing, and anyone who brings it up as an argument should be ashamed of themselves, since the Qur'an in many other verses makes it crystal clear that this couldn't have been the prophet, peace be upon him and his family. In Surah Al-Isra, chapter 17, verse 24, we read, وَاخْفِذْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ الذُّلِّ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ وَقُلْ رَبِّ رَحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَمْبَيَانِ صَغِيرًا And be humble with them out of mercy, and pray, my Lord, be merciful to them as they raised me when I was young. Allah revealed to his prophet to be kind towards one's parents, and to ask mercy for them. Is it logical to think this kind of behavior was only expected towards them, but not towards the other Muslims? especially the disabled amongst them. And in Surah Al-Shu'ara, chapter 26, verse 215, And be gracious to the believers who follow you. Wasn't the blind man a believer who was clearly seeking guidance? How then can the Prophet not be gracious towards him? Wouldn't this imply he disobeyed one of Allah's commands? And in Surah Al-Ahzab, chapter 33, verse 53, إِنَّ ذَٰلِكُمْ كَانَ يُؤْذِنَّ نَبِيَّ فَيَسْتَحْيِي مِنْكُمْ 
This conduct of yours hurts the Prophet, but he feels shy of telling you about it. If the Prophet feels shy to tell people that they're hurting him, do you really think it makes an ounce of sense that he would act in the opposite manner when a weak, peaceful and blind mind comes to him with good intentions seeking to purify himself? And in Surah At-Tawbah, chapter 9, verse 128, لقد جاءكم رسول من أنفسكم عزيز عليه ما عنتم حريص عليكم بالمؤمنين رؤوف رحيم. There certainly has come to you a messenger from among yourselves. He is concerned by your suffering, anxious for your well-being, and gracious and merciful to the believers. According to the non-Shia narrative, was the Prophet concerned by the suffering of the blind man? Was he anxious for his well-being? Did he show grace and mercy towards him? Or did he, as the fabrication says, frown and turn away from him? And in Surah Ali Amran, chapter 3, verse 159, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْفَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكَ it is out of Allah's mercy that you, O Prophet, have been lenient with them. Had you been cruel or hard-hearted, they would have certainly abandoned you. So pardon them, ask Allah's forgiveness for them, and console them in conducting matters. Is frowning and turning away from a blind mind leniency? Is this not being cruel and hard-hearted? Where is the pardon and the forgiveness? And in Surah Al-Anbiya, chapter 29, verse 107. And we have not sent you except as a mercy to the worlds. Billahi alaykum. Is this act that is falsely attributed to him mercy? The Quran says he's a mercy to the worlds, not that he's a mercy to only the healthy, rich, or powerful people. And finally, we read in Surah Al-Qalam, chapter 68, verse number 4. And indeed, you are of a great moral character. Of course, the Prophet ﷺ was morally good. No one denies this. But just to give you an idea of how great his morals were, let me give you an example. Imagine you play football, okay? Or soccer for our American viewers. Now imagine the following scenarios. Scenario number one. Imagine a random person passing by sees you playing and he compliments you. Naturally, you'll thank him, but you'll probably forget about it in five minutes because you don't know the person, nor does he know you. The second scenario. Imagine your friend who also plays football with you compliments you. Obviously, you'll be happier than the first scenario, and because you know your friend is sincere, it means you actually aren't bad at football. It's something to be proud of. Scenario number three. Imagine the coach of your team comes to you and compliments you. This holds much more weight because he has more experience in football. So by complimenting you, it means you are a really good player. Now the fourth and final scenario. Imagine Lionel Messi himself, or Ronaldo for the haters. He sees you playing and says, wow, you're a really good player. What will you and everyone else say? that you're extremely talented in football and you're worthy to be considered a prodigy. Now, going back to the verse, who is telling the prophet he has outstanding morals? Is it a random Bedouin? Is it a family member? Is it a religious scholar? Is it a spiritual Gnostic? Is it a king? Is it Fulan wa Fulan? It's Allah himself, the embodiment of goodness, who's telling him that. So when we say he had great morals, you better believe he did since the one responsible for morality is telling us he is. This is corroborated by the fact the Prophet said, I was sent to fulfill good characters. I'm not even going to cite a source for this because every Muslim agrees the Prophet said this. That's how famous this narration is. Tell me, someone who frowns and turns away from the blind man, is that a person who fulfills good character? Honestly, these people either haven't read the Qur'an or they actually have something against the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. May Allah save us from ever attributing such actions and behaviors to the one who was sent as a mercy to the world. In conclusion, be honest with yourself. If one day a blind man came to you seeking guidance, 
would you not only not dare, but even think of frowning and turning your face away from him? If the answer is no, then you seriously have to reconsider the image you have of the Prophet, if you believe he did it. Just think about it. If you as a Muslim find this narrative to be problematic, then what about non-Muslims? Don't you think this drives non-Muslims away from Islam because of the negative image and character they get from the Prophet? We need to go back to the source of guidance the Prophet left for us, and that is the Ahlul Bayt By following the Ahlul Bayt, we get the correct understanding of the Qur'an. Otherwise, as we've seen, you come up with made-up stories like these that, honestly, ruin the image of Islam and the Prophet. And with this, we end the video. I hope I have finally explained to all of you the correct story and narrative of Surat Abasa. And with this, I'll see you in the next time. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.